Ooh, countdown. Countdown. Nice. <laughs> Yay, we're live. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's keynote. Um, we are here with Julia CLG. Uh, I'm pronouncing that okay, I'm hope so. Uh, CLG. Um, and she's a software engineer and data scientist at R Studio. And uh, she will be the host of today's keynote. Um, before I give you the, the, the space, uh, Julia, just a quick announcement. Um, Memberge will be hosting a sponsor workshop just after the keynote uh, at 4.30 uh, p.m. CDT time. Uh, and a second session with the same material tomorrow or th Thursday uh, morning at 7 a.m. CD time to, again. Uh, both uh, events are hosted separately on a different uh, platform. Uh, so uh, just to announce it to, for everyone that is interested in that, uh, look for the, for the specific uh, event. Uh, and with that, uh, Julia, uh, let's start. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrea. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, so I am super happy and excited to be here sharing with you all about um, about applied machine learning, about um, machine learning practice um, using tidy models. So I appreciate so much the um, introduction that Andrea did. Um, I think I'll tell you a little bit more about who I am and how I got here and my, my own sort of experience with um, machine learning and practice with applied machine learning. So for some context about why I think about these things the way that I, the, that, um, I do and why I um, love to work with and contribute to tidy models. So my, unlike many of you, my background is not in um, stats, but rather in the physical sciences. Um, I have a background in um, physics and astronomy. Um, that's what my PhD is in. And I, um, at, you know, at the time when I was doing research, um, not many people were using um, modern machine learning methods in physics and astronomy. That, that's changed in the years since then. But um, I came from this background where I worked a lot with real world messy data that was generated by physical processes. I, you know, gathered it, analyzed it. And so when I, you know, later, a little bit later in my career came to data science and learned about, you know, modern machine learning, what we know about it, it how it is, I find myself really influenced by the, um, <clears throat> by, by um, my experience with doing work in the in the physical world you know like in the real world that this is something that I want I want to like I'm interested in the real uh, problems that practitioners face in their in their daily work work so um, I you know I've used this word machine learning so let's talk about what that is so like for most things there is a um, there's an X to CD for everything and I really love this one that pictures these two people one of them is asking, this is your machine learning system? And the other person is standing on this pile of like data and linear algebra <laughs> math and saying, yep, you know, you just take your data, you, you, you put it in this big pile, you do linear, linear algebra, and there you go. You get answers on the other side. Um, the person then asks, like, what if the answers are wrong? And, and then the second person, the person on the right, like, stirs, says, just, just stir the pile again until it starts looking right. And so this, um, this really highlights, like, what are we doing when we're doing machine learning, statistical learning, a predictive modeling, um, instead of um, using, you know, domain knowledge to set up rules for, um, for a computer to be able to give us an answer. We're using large amounts of data and then we're learning um, patterns. We're learning, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, rules perhaps. We're learning um, how we get from an input, a set of inputs to map to an output. So, um, you, you know, you may have heard, heard a lot of these phrases, I'm sure, I'm sure you have here at, uh, like the, at USAR. Um, and so what I'd like to do is frame where machine learning sits as it's often practiced and the kind of work that I'm particularly interested in. Um, so if we say artificial intelligence, that usually, that's the biggest, um, 
set, the largest set is artificial intelligence. And this includes approaches that are rules-based and approaches that are, you know, data-based. So we can either, you know, teach a computer to play chess by writing out rules for what the computer should do in many different situations, or we can teach the computer to play chess by feeding it you know, all the chess games that have ever been recorded and allow the computer to use an algorithm to understand what would work best and what would not. So artificial intelligence um, encompasses both of those approaches. Inside of that is um, what I would say is machine learning. These terms are all, you know, used in various ways, but I just want to give you some clarity to how I'm going to be using them. So machine learning sits inside and it is that carrot, that, category of things where we we don't tell the machine system what to do instead we give it a lot of data and allow it to learn what to do there's there's you know as this illustration says here's there's dozens of different ways to do this basically different algorithms to help um you know the computer the program learn from data and get to an output um, inside of machine learning, we have um, uh, neural nets. So neural nets are a way of mapping from inputs to outputs. You know, we can we can do this. You know, the the way the mapping it works, you can actually end up um, uh, modeling any any arbitrary function, right? With these with these neural nets, and then inside of that is deep learning, where we have um, not maybe a single mapping, a shallow mapping, but like a deep mapping, where we have lots of different layers here. So um, the work that I am most interested in kind of sits mostly outside the neural nets and inside of the machine learning. And this is an area where there's opportunities for huge impact when it comes to um, uh, you know, scientific work, when it comes to um, work in business, where it comes to um, actually even like work in the digital humanities, like um, under being able to have great tools to work in that area um, uh, scaffolds up so many people to, to be able to make good use of their data and be able to make better decisions. Um, you know, we have some kind of, I, I'm also a little bit interested in those other things like neural networks and deep learning, but only in the sense that they are one of the options, not in the sense that they are the thing um, that machine learning in practice, applied machine learning often should, should focus on, in my opinion. So if we're in there and I say, oh, there's dozens of different machine learning methods that are possible to have in here, um, uh, we might sort of make a little bit of a tree structure here to organize what, um, what kind of options there are. You know, depending on whether your data has um, a label or um, not a label, you might say you're doing supervised or unsupervised um, learning, um, depending on, you know, like uh, if you are trying to predict a category like you know, the color of the socks or predict, say, the, the, like the length of some tie, you'll be able to either be doing classification or regression. And we have the same kind of like there's different algorithms over on the unsupervised side. So tidy models, you know, the, which I'm going to be talking about today, provides ways for you to, um, you know, do anything on this slide, like do anything, well, almost anything, not the association, but do almost anything on this slide, um, provides access to all these different kinds of algorithms. But what I'd like to talk about today is that I don't think these algorithms on this page are, um, are the heart, are like the biggest challenge when it comes to applied machine learning, when it comes to machine learning in practice. Um, the you know, it's a, let's call it a necessary, but not sufficient condition to be able to look at the things on this slide, to know what they are, you know, when to apply them. That is important. But in this talk, I, what I want to say is ask the question, what's the hardest part about machine learning and practice? Is it, um, is it having those, um, those algorithms, um, like implemented and knowing when to choose them, I'm going to argue that that at, you know, as of today, for machine learning practitioners, that's that's not the hardest part. This is partly because of the amazing work that has been invested by people who develop new statistical methods and you know, like created open source software to do them. And so I'm not, you know, saying that is less important. But instead, what I'm saying is. 
for, you know, you know, you today, if you are going to develop a machine learning product, a machine learning system, having access to those algorithms is not the most important part. Um, I work on um, a team at our studio that builds the tidy models framework for modeling and machine learning. And one of our main goals is to see the, the, the parts of machine learning, of, the, of a machine learning process that are difficult, that are prone to error, and to um, make more fluent approaches for them. So it's the tidy models package, like it says here, is a collection of, or the tidy models framework is a collection of packages for modeling and machine learning. Um, using tidyverse principles. So if you have ever typed library tidyverse in a script and then thought, oh, I'll use ggplot2 for visualization. I'll use dplyr to manipulate my data. I'll use tidyr to reshape my data. You can think your mental model of tidy models can be um, this can be the same it is the same kind of thing. So the so tidy models is a meta package. It's a meta package that um, contains other packages inside of it. So here here they are the ones that have gotten attached when we you load um, tidy models. And if we look at these packages, these each um, are a modular piece of our software, a, a modular R package that is focused and built to work together. Um, so uh, let, let's look at this. So like Tune there is an R package that contains infrastructure for um, model tuning, for tuning hyperparameters for models. And if you, you know, model data is the one that contains some example data for us to be able to show you as the user examples in our documentation. So just like with the tidyverse that you might, um, load the whole thing and then use certain pieces of it. Tidy models is similar. You load it and then use different pieces of it. So in my opinion, you don't need to like stress too much about what function comes from what package specifically, but it's good to kind of have an overall high level understanding that there's different modular things that, ins that are inside of it to be able to um, use. The reason why, um, tidy models exist as a modular collection of packages instead of say like one big giant thing is that um, this makes it easier for us and it makes it easier for you. So it makes it easier for us as the developers and the maintainers of the packages because we can we can do more frequent releases of smaller you know components, these modular components. It uh, reduces the complexity of, um, of maintaining these packages. And also makes it easier for you as a user, as a machine learning practitioner, um, because these uh, these components um, are are separated so that if you only need some of them, um, especially in a deployment context, you you can only get some of those. So, for example, one one thing that I would you know, put as an example, there is actually the tune package. So once you have chosen a model that you're going to use in your final system and deploy, then you don't need that, that tuning infrastructure anymore. It's fairly hefty and there's no reason to put, you know, that package into say um, a container that you're going to use to deploy. So that's a little bit about what um, Tidy Models is here. So um, uh, I am very excited that um, my my um, boss Max and I um, are publishing a book about how to use Tidy Models. So um, this book is um, you know in its final stages of editing with O'Reilly, and what it offers is like a beginning to end, really deep dive in Tidy Models and what it does. So if you find yourself interested in what we're doing and what, what we're talking about here, then um, that would be a great resource to follow up on. The book is available in its entirety at um, tmwr.org, so Tidy Modeling with R. And so the book there is um, uh, there, uh, like an online version is the book. Um, I love the cover of this book. That's a European robin. Um, I think it is one of the cutest O'Reilly covers that I have ever seen. And um, I, uh, the picture that you see in the background of these other slides is in fact um, also a European robin. Okay, so today um, what I would like to do is address that question. 
what is what is the hardest thing about machine learning and practice like right now today and uh talk about three three things that can be challenges and how tidy models addresses them the first one is how to spend your data budget, how to think about the data that you have and be able in a principled and consistent way decide how to spend your data budget. The second one is to think carefully about where your model starts, where your model ends, and be able to build your model analyses, your um, deployment strategies with this in mind about what is it that is contained in your model. And last, I will talk about how to get your model off your laptop. So if you are someone who, you know, you have experience maybe with um, stats, you have um, experience with um, uh, predictive modeling, you know, you know how to do that, right? Like you have a lot of skill as a model developer. Um, I think one of the hardest things as of today is to actually get that model where it needs to go to have um, impact in your organization, how to deploy your model. So that is the last of our three topics for today. So let's start with that first one. <clears throat> how do we spend our data budget? So um, in any modeling project, in any modeling analysis, um, you have a certain amount of data. You have access to a certain amount of data and you have to decide how um, to allocate it or how to spend it. So when you start starting some kind of um, model uh, project, machine learning project, this is often one of the first, actually one of the first steps you take is deciding how to spend your budget. And um, the Tidy Models framework gives you um, tools to do this in a um, uh, st st statistically reliable way. So the, um, the package, so remember we said Tidy Models is a framework, a meta, meta package that has packages inside of it. So the package that helps you um, spend your data budget in the best way is called R-Sample. So R-Sample kind of like, like resample sample R-Sample here. <clears throat> so often when we first start, like the first thing that we need to do with a um, with uh, the data in our modeling package is to do an like a data splitting. So we have our initial, our original sort of pool of data. And in modeling and machine learning, what we want to do is we want to decide how much of this data am I going to use to estimate model parameters? And how much of this data am I going to use to estimate like how that model that I, you know, learned some parameters for, how is it going to perform? Many machine learning um, algorithms or approaches, right, like things that are kind of you can put into that sort of tree-shaped diagram that we had, um, many of those kinds of algorithms are very powerful and that they can, um, you know, get close to or literally memorize the training data. So if we put too much of our data into our, um, into our, into estimating the model parameters or the training data, then we will not get a very good job of how our model, our, our, how well our model will perform. We will in fact be fooled into thinking it does better than it should. Um, on the other side, if we, on the other hand, if we put too much data into um, the test set, which tests how a model performs, then we're losing out on our ability to, um, our ability to, uh, uh, you know, learn the best parameters given the data that we have. So this is why at the beginning, this is one of the first things you will see, you know, this is literally one of the first things you'll do when you start on a modeling anal analysis is to make this split. In tidy models, um, we do this with a function called initial split. And I'm going to show you just a little bit of um, um, uh, syntax here to get so you can get a flavor of how this works so this um i'm going to use the our our friend the the palmer penguins data which there was such a great talk on earlier um so uh, if you haven't seen that i recommend that you check it out but the, it's this data set that is you know such a good one for understanding how things work um and for using for demonstration and teaching so here let's let's split the palmer penguins data into training and testing here this this is something around 75%, 85% is often kind of the best, like this is kind of like the best way to land if you want to um, uh, 
learn the model parameters as best as you can and also still be able to estimate how your model performs at, at the same time. Notice that, so this is a little, you know, little data set here of um, 333 penguins or is what I'm working with. And notice that 249 have gone into the training set and 84 have gone into the test set. Now I can use these functions um, to get out the training and testing sets. So this this is a split. So this is a split that keeps track of what goes into training and testing. And then these functions, training and testing, will pull those out and give us data here at, at, um, to deal with. So we can, you know, let's, so this training data, this is what we would use to estimate model parameters, like to learn from this data. And this testing data is what we would use to, um, to measure how well the model is performing. So this this te testing data, in fact, is um, is precious. It is um, uh, it is it, it has one purpose. The one purpose of testing data is to tell you how your model is going to perform on new data. So um, because of this, we can't. We can't just go willy nilly using our testing data, you know, in any way. In fact, we have to save our testing data until the very end of our um, of our whole modeling analysis, and um, it, it can use be used only once. Um, you know, maybe twice if you're doing like comparing two things, but like this is not something that can be reused. So given that, um, how, so I, it's like, okay, I need to use that training data. Um, how can I use that training data to say compare two models? If, you know, I, I just, you know, we, we know like if we're training with some powerful um, machine learning algorithm, we just are, you know, uh, when we're comparing on the training set, what we're doing is measuring the, the model's ability to memorize that training set, not necessarily how well it generalizes to new data. How do we use it to tune models? Many machine learning models have um, hyperparameters. So things, parameters of the model you can't use, you can't learn from training, training data, but you have to decide ahead of time. How do we decide what those um, hyperparameters are? So the answer that we use in tidy models um, in general, and then the approach that we take in tidy models is to use resampling. So this, and this, when you see this, um, this diagram, like I want you to think, spend your data budget, spend your, set up a budget where you allocate certain parts of the data to certain categories, and then realize if you put it in one category, you can't use it in the other. So here we will um, split our data into training and testing. And then in the training data, we will create many resamples. So here we have like one, two, up to B. And what these resamples do is they allow us to create um, uh, simulated versions of the training set that let us um, have a substrate, let's say, for um, comparing models, evaluating models, tuning models before we go, you know, before, because we cannot use that testing set, which is um, only has one purpose, estimating, telling us how well our model perform on new data. So there are lots of different ways to create these resamples. So I'm going to show you a couple of them that we have support for in tidy models to give you an idea of how this works. So cross validation is um, uh, is, is a common one, often a very good default. So let's say we had you know 30 examples here, and we want to be able to make cross validation resamples. We can randomly um, divide these um, observations into um, buckets. Um, into categories here. So here there are three. The shapes and the colors correspond to our three um, our three categories here. And so how cross validation works is that um, we using based on these three um, three divisions that we made into our in our training data. Um, we will end up with that many folds or cross-validation folds. And so in the first fold that we make, um, we hold out one of the categories that we have. Um, and then the other, the model is fit using everything else. In the second fold, we hold out a different one and everything else goes into the, um, the, the, the subset that the model is fit using, and so on for model uh, three as well. This example, this this um, this illustration here shows three fold 
cross-validation, where we've divided the data that we have into three um, subsets and then use them to construct this um, <clears throat> these folds that we can use. So what we can do here is we can train any model that we're interested in multiple times. In this example, three times. So we'll get three fits and then we, for each of those fits, we will have a, um, a different measure of the performance there. In tidy models, this looks like this. So I want to um, uh, note have you notice a couple of things. Um, so the we're we're creating the resamples from the training data. Um, the training data is what we use to do this. These make these simulated training sets, and we um, we have a default here. That's a sensible default. We, when we are in a situation where often it can be challenging to figure to set up a data budget that works well for your um, for your needs, what we have here is this you know sensible defaults that work in many situations. Um, we we can stratify this so that um, we can end up if we're gonna you know say we want to predict the species of these penguins, we can um, stratify our sample so that we make, we do the sa sampling within some strata, a set of strata, so that we have, say, even proportions of the species in each of our resamples here. So cross-validation is a um, uh, often a good default at the si data set sizes that we will typically be using some of these machine learning algorithms for. But there's other ways to do this kind of resampling. So we can um, uh, do bootstrap resampling here. And so this works a little differently. You know, we, um, we will take, we had originally, let's say we had these 30 examples. You can draw with replacement um, from, from the training set until you get to the training set size. This means you have some um, some duplicates, right? Like notice that in that first one, one, the first um, uh, observation is in there twice. And then anything that did not end up in that in that um, that first set, uh, you you hold out. So notice that two in the in Bootstrap iteration one, the the number two, the observation two is not in the um, data that we fit the model with. It's in the data that we assess the model with. And so we do this, you know, as many times as we want to to be able to um, create this set of simulated. Um, simulated training sets here. So bootstrapping looks like this. It has a bit, you know, like in tidy models, it has the same, um, the same interface here. We can stratify. Um, these are, these are two, you know, common approaches that we would use for, um, for resampling. And what our sample provides is, are these, um, uh, these functions to be able to spend your data wisely to create those these simulated validation sets. So we have different options that are um, that work well in um, in different kind of like data situations here. <clears throat> so notice that that like a validation split is on that list. So in the tidy models framework, we th we think of a validation split as just another kind of resample. It just happens to be a resample that you just do one time. All right, so that is um, spending your data budget. This is something that can be challenging to get right, but Tidy Models um, uh, offers an opinionated set of um, functions and infrastructure that, with some guardrails on it to help you land in, um, in a safe and reliable place. Next, let's start about, let's talk about um, where your model starts and ends. So if we're, you know, if we're starting a modeling analysis, we might, our, our minds often will first jump to um, um, the, the model, the model that we're going to use. It's like, oh, am I going to tune an XGBoost model or am I going to do something like regularized regression? Like what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And we think of that, we center that in our minds as the model. We might think about our model something like this where we have, you know, data some that we spent our data budget correctly, like as we talked about in the last section, we know, you know, which one of them are the predictors. We, we have decided, you know, um, what to use as predictors or, or, you know, we have available some, you know, columns that we can use as predictors. We might think about, okay, I need to do a bit of feature engineering or pre-processing 
But then, then the modeling starts. Then I really get started with the modeling. Then that's the model. That's what I'm going to think about. And at the end, I have, I have my fitted model. I have my fitted trained model that I can use, um, you know, for model explainability or to deploy it or to communicate it about it. This though, this though is the wrong way to think about what your model is because many of those steps in what we call feature engineering or pre-processing to get a, a model ready for whatever it is we're doing with it, um, that they, they together, they together are um, uh, the model workflow. Like they, they are both they both contain components that are learned from data, that are estimated from training data. And if we think about our model this way, we are going to, unfortunately, um, fall into the trap of data leakage. We are going to, if we do something like estimate principal component analysis using, um, using all the training data, um, we, you know, thinking about like, oh, that, that's separate. I just do that first and then, I, then I'll get to modeling. We unfortunately will be very disappointed when it comes time to, um, you know, have that model perform on new data. We will, um, we will fall into the trap of data leakage. Instead, we, the correct way, the right way to think about where does my data, where does my model start and end is that your model starts with anything that involves learning from the training data. This includes feature engineering and pre-processing steps. So the package in Tidy Models that helps us um, handle this well is called workflows. And so what workflows, I, the, I, what I would like you to think about workflows is a way to stick things together in a convenient way, um, both because it is then easier for us to like write code that looks pretty and um, we can organize our code, but also because it allows us to more clearly um, specify what is part of our model. Where does our model begin and end? So let's, um, let's look at that and let's stick some things together like Legos so that we can carry them around. So let's say we are interested with our, um, with our penguin data. We want to um, say we want to um, uh, train a random forest model. And we're going to classify the species, what species of penguin it is, let's say based on these three things, like information about the bill and um, se the sex of the penguin. When in tidy models, we put these together inside of a workflow. So the workflow contains um, it contains everything that um, encompasses everything that is learned by the by the training data here. This is um, a fairly straightforward preprocessor. Um, in fact, it's so straightforward that I can just use R's formula interface for it. A random forest model um, doesn't need a lot of special feature engineering. It's very, it'll, it's like, just throw anything at it. And it's like, I can do it. I can do it. You know, like that's what a random forest can do. Um, and, and a workflow works for this kind of, um, a workflow provides you like an interface to be able to deal with these very um, uh, flexible models, tree-based models that can deal with a lot of different kinds of data. Uh, and then once we have this workflow, we can um, fit the data to, um, let's say, to our, we can fit this model to our training data. So um, now notice that our workflow is trained. We have fit this random forest model to our, um, to our training data. How, not all models are like this, though. Um, and many models require special feature engineering or data preprocessing. And then in many cases, we want to use feature engineering, not because it's required for the model, but instead because it, um, it will, it, we get better performance. We can use domain knowledge or something like that. So in tidy models, the package that provides this infrastructure for treating feature engineering and recipes as a first class citizen, as something with the same dangers of data leakage as a model, that is called recipes. So the, the idea of a recipe here is that you have some ingredients in your pantry. They're your variables. They're, you're like, ah, this one's the outcome in our case. Um, um, the species is the outcome. These ingredients that I have here, these are the um, uh, predictors, like the information about the bill and the sex. So I've got some, um, I've got some ingredients 
And then what I want to do is I want to write out how am I going to transform those those variables, those ingredients into a um, into a final um, uh, product. So it, we will take we can we can like in a recipe we write out steps of how, what we're going to do. We write out steps in a recipe. And then we we prepare it and bake it, and we're able to um, like uh, uh, say what's going to happen in our recipe, and then execute it on on our data. So let's look at this here. So let's go back to our penguins, and let's say, you know what? I am going to use a different model, not a random forest, but one that requires some pre-processing. Um, we would write out a recipe that looks something like this. So our, for our recipe, we would um, start out by saying what our ingredients are, what our variables are, and then um, in this case, add two steps. We're gonna have two steps of what we do to this data. So this recipe, it has some information in it. It knows what our outcomes, what our predictors. Um, the tidy models infrastructure has, um, I'm going to use the word obsessive um, uh, attention paid to the separation between outcomes and predictors so that we don't fall into the trap of data leakage and um, find ourselves, you know, disappointed at the end when we end up with not understanding our, uh, how it kind of performance will get. So we've got, we know what our ingredients are and then we, um, we can, um, um, we know what steps we're going to apply to our data here. Now, this recipe can go into um, a workflow. Let's say here we're going to use a support vector machine, um, and, we, and which is a model that does require, you know, this kind of pre-processing that we have. We've got to have everything on the same scale. We can't have any categorical data anymore. We have to, we have to take care of all of that before we get to our support vector machine. But we notice I'm using the same kind of interface, even though I have a different model, I have a different, like much more complex pre-processing here, I get to use the same kind of interface to be able to, um, uh, to be able to answer the question, where does my model start and end? And again, we can, um, we can fit this just in the same way that we fit this before. So we get this, we get this um, consistent way of handling many models, many different kinds of feature engineering steps, and have clarity about what, what is part of my modeling process, my modeling workflow, and, and, and where, when does it stop? When does it start? All right. So, so we talked about spending your data budget. Then we talked about um, where your model starts and end. And let's start on this on this last section on getting your model off your laptop. So you, I think you probably have noticed as I've been talking along that like these are the kinds of um, common failure modes when it comes to machine learning projects, modeling projects. Like, oh, I I wasn't careful about how I set up my data to start with. Oh, I um, I did feature engineering with all the data and now I have data leakage, like, right, like through my feature engineering. These are things that are common um, common failure modes and or like things that it can be unclear what to do. Um, this is, I think, never more true than when it comes to, like, oh, I trained a model. Now what? Like, now what do I do with the model now that I have trained it? Um, so, so it is, can be quite challenging as someone who works with data, who works with models, to um, take, you know, something that maybe was in an R Markdown script or, you know, and maybe something I was using locally on my computer. Like, how do I take that final trained model and how do I um, integrate it into my um, organization's IT infrastructure? How do I, how do I deploy it? And so the package that, um, that addresses these kinds of questions is called um, Vetiver. So Vetiver is um, a, pa a newer package that I work on that I'm really excited about because these are some of, I think, the kinds of tasks that has been so unclear what to do. People have been taking very heterogeneous approaches um, because there hasn't been a really reliable or fluent open source tooling. So here is what... Um, here is what we think Vetiver does. Here's here is here's we think where we think Vetiver sits. So um, Vetiver, uh, if you've if you're if you're kind of into perfume 
or like fancy candles or something like that. You may have heard the word vetiver. It might, you might be ringing a bell for you. We're like, ah, oh, vetiver. I feel like I've seen that somewhere. So what vetiver is, is it's an ingredient um, in perfume and it is a stabilizing ingredient. So many, you know, of the fragrances that people put in perfume or candles are, they're very volatile, right? And so that's like, that's what your model is like, right? You're like, oh, what versions of packages did I use to train it? What, like, I've got this binary object. Where do I put it? How do I know which version of the model we're using? So vetiver, um, it, the, the actual, not the package, but the actual thing in the real world, it's called the oil, it's also known as the oil of tranquility, and it's used as a stabilizing ingredient. So that's what, that's what vetiver, the software does for your models. So, um, Vetiver addresses ML ops kinds of tasks. So this, this like sort of cycle that you see here starts from collecting data, you know, you, you understand and clean your data, getting, get it ready for um, modeling. You train and evaluate your model so that you, you know, you pick, you get the best one, the most appropriate one. Then it's time to deploy your model. After your model is deployed, it turns out you're not even done there. Then you have to monitor that model that has been de deployed to be able to make sure um, that it's performing as expected. And when it changes or something happens, you often will then want to um, get new data and, and uh, start over again, like go towards retraining your model. So there are great tools, great open source tools that many of you know and love to work um, to work at different stages of this. So if you are over, um, like if you are collecting data, you're probably working with some kind of database um, technology. If it's time to understand and clean your data, you know, like maybe you use the tidyverse, maybe use data.table, maybe you're a Python. I, I mean, you listening right now are probably not a Python person but maybe you do sometimes like use pandas or numpy lots of great tools then you it's time to go to train and evaluate your model um, again here so many great open source tools that people are familiar with that work well tidy models which i've been talking to you about maybe carrot maybe maybe you are in the python word maybe you train your models using um, pytorch or or scikit learn or something like that again Lots of great tools are out there already that are open source, that work um, great. <clears throat> when we get over to this other side of this cycle, there are fewer tools and especially fewer open source tools that um, are available to say, here, here is, um, a, you know, a framework or a set of um, functions, you know, like that help you deploy your model. He, you know, like here, here is how you go about monitoring your model. Like there are fewer options altogether, and then also very few open source options once you get over to deploy and monitor. And that is where Vetiver sits. Vetiver sits over here with these MLOps tasks where you um, you have you did a great job training your model, developing your model, and now you need to get that model off your laptop. So this is what Vetiver code looks like. I'm going back to this um, penguins example. That so let's say that support vector machine that I trained um, a couple of slides earlier. Um, I load the Vetiver package and then I create a Vetiver model. So a Vetiver model, think of think of it as a deployable object, an object that contains in it what you need to get it ready to um, uh, to to deploy. So here, um, you know, there's some printout here. Notice that it automatically learned um, or, or picked off some things about it that are important when it comes time to deploy. It could, it can tell me that this is, you know, this is a tidy models workflow, but it used the lib linear engine um, for, you know, learning the support vector machine model. It it's telling me that it has three features. It knows what's there. So, um, and th you can do this kind of creation of vetiver models in R for, for tidy models, for carrot, for MLR3, for, um, you know, regular random for it, like ranger models for LM and GLM. Like we have support in here that you can create, you can learn, you can create a deployable, like a ready to deploy thing from all these different kinds of models. Once you have that model, 
that is ready to go, then you can create um, uh, create a REST API that is re ready to go as a microservice somewhere or um, um, anywhere that you might want to put up this kind of um, interface to your model here. So this uses Plumber, but it creates a special endpoint that's model aware, where we know things about um, uh, that it was a model, because we knew that at prediction time, and we can create this special model aware endpoint, which by default is called predict here. So let's um, let's talk a little bit about um, Vetiver and what it gets you and what you might be interested in. And then I'll show just a little bit of a demo here. So what Vetiver provides, it provides um, like push button deploy to our Studio Connect. So this is a this is a product that our studio has. It's great for um, uh, data science workflows. It also, if you don't if you don't use our Studio Connect, it provides ways for you to generate Docker files for many other kinds of deployment targets. So let's say you want to deploy your model to um, AWS or to Google Cloud Platform or to Azure or to, you know, a server sitting, you know, in your company's office. You can use a Docker file to contain... Um, uh, like all the dependencies, all of um, all of the code that you need to be able to set up this REST API. What Vetiver will do is uh, generate those for you, uh, so that you you don't have to um, stress out about what needs to go into the Docker file, but instead use use these generated Docker files. So if you are new to Docker, um, there was a um, there was a tutorial on it earlier in the conference, and um, my coworker Alex Gold gave a talk about Docker. Um, uh, I think earlier today, and so those are great resources for you know to start getting into it. You know. Docker files have not probably been part of the workflows of, let's say, most our users up to now. But um, what Vetiver, Vetiver provides you this um, this infrastructure to, you know, that you could get started. Like you can do this right now. So let me show you what one of these looks like. So um, this is an example of a Docker file that is generated by Vetiver. So I I didn't write any of like I didn't write this Docker file. Instead, I said. I have a model and I want to deploy it with a Docker file. And I, you know, I use the function that is in Vetiver and this is the output of that. So a few things that I want to highlight for you in this, um, it contains the information about R and R version. It contains the information about system dependencies. It contains information about package versions through that rnv.lock file. So all of that is captured and automatically um, automatically um, used for you. So I am going to show you a example of what um, that ever looks like here. So what I'm showing you here is um, a, an, an endpoint that is really running right now on my computer, and this is um, this is all automatically generated. This um, this visual documentation, as we as we call it. So here we've got you know like a health check, a ping endpoint to know that our API is up or not, and then here we have our predict endpoint where the main part of this happens. Notice, so notice that like I've got all this stuff here. This is all automatically generated because we knew it at training time. So when it comes to deployment time, we can just hold that information, like the fact that you know this particular model has three features, we can we can capture it and then use it when we deploy there um, all together. So notice, let's notice a few things about what we're getting with this model, this visual documentation. We know now what kind of, um, what kind of um, data we need to post to this endpoint. Uh, it gives us, in fact, the information here. And I can click over here to example, and I can actually interact with my model here. So let's say we had a penguin that um, the bill length was 40, and the bill depth is 15. And let's say it is a female penguin. If I 
um, and I hit try, what is happening right now is showing me how the model works. Like what, what will I get back? And I can go over here and I actually get the, like the curl here that tells me exactly how to interact with these models. And I can share all of this here with my, um, like let's say like a software engineer um, coworker or a or an SRE or IT person in my company, I can say, look, here is how my model API works. Um, I can you can look at this directly, and this is this is all built onto um, open API specifications that are automatically. Um, uh, learn from your model. So let's you know we can you know play around with this more and see like how will the model work um, and this gives us um, a way for people who do not have the model directly you know in on their computer be able to interact with it through a, through a restful API so let me go back to my slides and there we go Okay, so here's the Docker file again, and then um, I will I will start to sum up here. And what I will say is that um, these three topics that uh, we that I talked about today, um, the reason I chose them are I think these are some of the um, the most motivating reasons why you might choose to use Tidy Models. Um, tidy Models provides um, uh, sensible defaults, statistical guardrails, things that help you to succeed when it's time for you to build um, a, like a machine learning model. Um, we, I've, I've, you know, only touched the surface of a lot of um, these issues. And so I think that um, we are really excited for people to um, go out and learn more like start to learn more about how they can apply tidy models in your real work. So I've got a couple of links here. Um, tidymodels.org, great place to start. Um, the book, um, Tidy Modeling with R, TMWR, that's a great place to dig deeper. And then I also have screencasts that walk you through how to do this and blog posts that are like sort of standalone examples using, um, uh, you know, real data sets to be able to learn more about this. So as I end here and we go to a couple of questions, I just want to make sure to thank my teammates on the Tidy Models team, um, the creators of the Palmer, Palmer Penguins data set, and um, uh, at, because of their, like, what they have done being able to give this talk today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Julia, for an excellent uh, talk, and thank you so much. It was uh really really interesting uh we have a bunch of questions here so i will try to um to give you a, 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 some of them but the first one and uh, because i know it's a popular one is where and if we can find the slides uh later after the talk i can share the slides later yeah i can share the slides later i don't have them up anywhere right now but i'm happy to do that Thank you. Uh, that was a really popular one. Uh, so I wanted to get that one off the way. Uh, and then I'm going to, to uh, read you a couple of ones. Uh, yes, we have time. OK, the first one uh, says, is there a way to version the API produced by Vetiver so you can update your models with support but support or older versions? Yes. Yeah, so we so when we were you know, starting on the process of model ops, ML ops, starting the design for um, Vetiver. I actually did a, like a whole series of user interviews of people either from open source or from our studio's customers of like, what were they doing now? What were common things they tripped up over or that they, they're like, oh, now this is failing because of X. And one of them, like one of the common things we found is that, um, uh, it's it's very needed for people to have access to many versions of the model that they can that you can get to older versions of the model easily that you can maybe update the model, um, but that it does not disrupt or change the model API. So to say it another way, the model API needs to be strongly linked to one version of the model, but we want to be able to get to lots of versions of the model. So in, in Vetiver, the versioning is separated in concern from the deployment. And what this allows you to do is to not fall into some of those, those problems. So any given 
model API that's deployed is strongly linked to one version of the model. But then as a, you know, let's say your boss is like, oh, I need you to go back and do such and such analysis, you know, with this model. And then you say, oh, wait, okay. So last month we had version A of the model running and this version, this month we have version B. So I need to be able to separate, I need to get to both. So you can get to both using the, 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 approach or strategy that Vetiver um, uh, uses. Great, thank you. Now we'll keep on with the next one. Uh, it says, what is the difference between validation split and initial split? That's a great question. So validation, so here's something that is the same about both of them. They both split your data into two subsets to um, two smaller categories of data. Here's what's different. So um, uh, the initial split function, or when you think about splitting your data into training and testing, um, that is set up so that your testing data is um, uh, going to be used only once. Like the testing data is set up so that it doesn't just... Um, it is not it is not available to be used for um, tuning for for choosing between models. A validation split, which you run on a um, uh, a trick like you 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 create a validation split from training data, that validation split is just treated like any other kind of resample. So um, it is the same in what they both say, ah, I'm taking my, your data, I'm splitting it into two things, but it's different in that the object that comes out of it in one case is um, uh, just set up for us to be able to use it only as testing data. We cannot use it as, for other purposes. The validation split sets up a single resample, a resample that we did one time so that we can, we can use a validation split for, um, for tuning, for evaluating different models. Super clear. Thank you. And I have another one related to initial split here. So we will go ahead with that one. It says, can initial split apply to stratified splits to maintain class balance or imbalance? Um, yes. So initial, actually all of the resampling approaches that we have, um, allow you to use stratified resampling. Um, is that correct? I think that's correct. Yes. Um, there may be, I think there are some situations like if you're doing grouped resample, grouped resampling that it doesn't really apply, but for, yes, for all the ones like I'm creating training and testing. I'm maybe creating training and testing from, from um, time series data. And so I want to create a special kind of split where I, you know, the older data goes into training, the newer data goes into testing. So the answer is yes. Great. Uh, we have a, uh, yeah, we have time left. Um, let's say, okay. Are there any functions for repeated K-fold cross-validations? And do you have any recommended strategies for repeated cross-validations? Strategies, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the answer is yes. So in fact, I think some of the functions that I showed in this exact, um, on these exact slides, have the opportunity to not just say do tenfold cross-validation, but to do um, repeated tenfold cross-validation so that you do it multiple times. And this, you know, at this point we're getting to like computationally maybe quite heavy kind of approach, but um, this can be a good fit um, in some situations where you want to, um, uh, where you want to, you know, maybe you need to have more, um, you, you measure the performance of your model on these um, small holdout sets and you need more, um, uh, you know, less variance, more, you need more um, precision in how you're measuring those. And that is when, that's when we would use them. In terms of the integration into the tidy models ecosystem, it works the same. So you don't need special strategies in terms of actually fitting our tuning. Great. And then another one, uh, it says, well, thank you for the presentation, says Dennis. And is there any plan for Implicit auto ML integration. Um, I would so I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. 
for a nice announcement. But I am, will just briefly, I will just briefly say yes. And I, and I will stop, I will leave it at that. Exciting, okay. And uh, another one, it says, uh, what's the difference between data science and AI? So I would say, I would say, so they're, they're like an overlapping Venn diagram, but not one inside the other. So AI, as I like to use this phrase, is like um, computers making, you know, intelligent choices, like, like telling us something, choosing between options, something like that. And AI can involve almost um, no data, right? Like, like I am going to use my domain knowledge to set up rules. Um, I am going to, you know, maybe use, use some, uh, you know, set some set of programmed rules to say what to do. And then AI can also include learning from data. Data science it involves data all the time. So I think we have this overlapping Venn diagram where some data science, like machine learning, is part of data science, but there are parts of data science that don't involve any machine learning or modeling. And, you know, in my experience, um, like I, I love machine learning, I love modeling, I think it's so interesting. But often, if you don't have the non ML parts of your data infrastructure in good shape, like you're not going to be able to get to good outcomes with your machine learning. So it, it could be argued maybe that the non-ML parts of data science are the parts that, um, you know, have like the biggest impact per unit of investment. Super. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of questions left, but let's see. Uh, it says the next one, how do you measure data leakage? Um, so if you were thinking like a, sort of a quantity, um, you would probably look at how your, um, how your model performs. So say, say, say you have a model, you trained it on your training data, you estimated it on your test data that you held back and you're like, oh, okay, things look good. And then you go start to use it in the real, in the real world with new data, data you did not have when you were training. If you see differences in performance metrics, which I didn't talk a ton about in this talk, but we have a really great package for metrics called Yardstick. So if your metrics on new data there, they look bad. <laughs> they look bad. You're like, oh no, compared to what you were expecting to get from test data. That's like the classic sign of data leakage. That's the classic sign that something has gone um, poorly. It doesn't mean it's not the only reason you might see that, but it is, I'm going to say very common reason why you might see that. Great, thank you. Uh, we have uh, two questions regarding the deployment of Bediver, so I guess I can uh, couple them up together. The first one is, uh, does the Bediver deployment work on Shiny? And the other one is that it is the same, but on AWS. Okay, great, yes. So um, if you have a Shiny app that you want to um, get you want to connect to a model. Say you want the Shiny app to um, maybe give a nice user, um, like user interface, I guess was, is what I'll say, to, to the model. Then you can use Vetiver in the Shiny app to read the model. And you can make a choice. Like, do you always want to read one version of the model? Do you always want to read? Do you always want to get in the latest version of the model? But what that what using Vetiver with Shiny lets you do is have um, uh, a a fluent way to get to your model to get the outputs of the model. Um, and also what it lets you do is it lets you separate the deployment of the model from the deployment of the app. And often when we get the, like, when these things are all bunched together in one thing, you, you end up with really rough edges. You end up being like, oh, I've got to deploy my whole app again because I changed the version of the model. What it lets you do is separate those things so that the things that are, that need the same computational environment um, are, are separate. So like, or, or I mean, the things that need 
different computational variants are separate. So like a shiny app needs like its its barest dependencies, right? Like are different from the model. Um, and so you can separate those um, from each other. And then you asked a question about AWS. So um, this I'm going to say I'm excited to sh show more soon. Um, we're actually working on some, some nice um, demos for how to do this um, on AWS. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of those um, by our studio conf, actually. So that'll be great to see. Great, thank you. And that was exactly a question if there were any examples uh, available. So I guess that was a perfect answer for that. Um, uh, another one, uh, it says, if I have a data set of 2 million rows and over 30 features, is it too big for the data models? And if there's a reasonable size limit? Yeah, um, so the limits of tidy models are, I would say, the same limits as the limits of R. So if you are, um, you know, if you are training, say you use, you know, AWS or similar, like if you can spin up, you know, something that has enough RAM to be able to train such a model, um, there's nothing, nothing is a blocker. The overhead, the overhead for tidy models has been carefully Tidy models has been carefully designed so that the overhead is very minor compared to data set sizes. So um, that is that is largely true or al almost entirely true across all of Tidy models. So the, the limits that you end up are just the limits to in-memory data, which are the same in Python, you know, like it's just all the same. If you have bigger than memory data, um, which, you know, we do sometimes, right, um, then you can look to options like Spark, um, uh, like operating on a database. And so in tidy models, we would point you to some of our, um, some of our Spark infrastructure or um, some the package tidy predict, which lets you like operate in a database itself. So um, I would say it's just the same as any time you're talking about in-memory data. So it's nothing is different about it. Thank you. Uh, and another one, it says, a colleague told me that if a procedure has cross-validation built into it, you don't need to split it into test and training samples. How would you respond to that? I would say that that is largely not the safest choice, not the choice that will get you the most reliable um, estimate of how your model will perform on new data. Um, you know, are there situations where people do this and get away with it? Yes, yes. But is it the plan that will, um, that will, that you can have the most confidence in the results that you get no, it's that is not the plan that will give you um, the most reliable reliable results. Um, depending on the specific specifics of your data or the specifics of your um, of the kind of model that you use, um, having that one final held out data set um, is incredibly important and incredibly. Um, uh, like impactful in terms of how it allows you to estimate what, um, like what what you what is what's going to happen after you deploy the model. So yeah, so I would say certainly people do this, and in some situations, you know, not the end of the world, but it's not overall a best general strategy. Great. Uh, thank you. And another one, it says about the Docker file. So it says, after you have the Docker file done, how does one fit in a new predictor data to deploy the model? Sure. So locally, so locally, if you have the Docker file, you create the Docker file, you build the Docker file, and then it's like you have a little computer little mini computer on your computer that you're that you're dealing with and so you can um uh treat it like um like an like a rest api like you're like oh, i'm going to call this docker container right here people don't usually build docker containers just to run them on their own computer right like usually build it and then push it up to some server some cloud service um so that it can then sit there and so you just just like what i showed you make um you make uh, API calls. You make you use this RESTful 
endpoint and you um, and you interact with it over HTTP. Um, I, I didn't really get into like why HTTP, um, like why RESTful APIs. Um, I we do you know in the research that we did about what approach to take with Vetiver, it became clear this is the industry standard for a reason. And um, if if you're up for more talks um, about you know a month from now, um, one of the software engineers on my team, Isabel Zimmerman, is going to give a talk exactly on like. What is MLOps? Why do we use REST APIs? Like, what, what is involved with this? So Isabel is going to be giving that talk at our studio conf in about a month, and that will be, um, that will be uh, like, streamed as well. So you can catch that wherever you are in the world. Super. Um, and we have another one of Vediver here that seems interesting. It says, how easy slash difficult is it to use Vediver? MLOps tools across multiple models. It says, for example, training one model per US state. So having 50 uh, models. Yeah. 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 So um, I would say having super fluent tooling for managing multiple models, it's something that's like in the next step for Vetiver. Um, the right now, you would, you know, you would still like, okay, let's make lots of Docker files or like lots of deployments on our Studio Connect. Um, let me use, you know, whatever. Like, let's take the Connect example as one. Like, you, you would, it would be the same on another cloud provider. You're like, you go to the, you know, control pane or whatever, and you see, oh, okay, I've got all these models um, here. Let me, you know, keep track of them in some way. However, this is one of the um, next areas of focus for Vetiver is for the use case of someone who has a dozen models, a hundred models. How does that that model developer um, understand their performance, the model performance of these, and how do they organize, um, understand how they're, like where their models are and how they're doing. So that, that's, that's um, I would say, one of our important priorities um, for future work. Thank you for the explanation. And uh, just the last one, a quick one, I think. Uh, it's about the name Vetiver. So it says, is there a story behind it? Um, so I, so I, ha I must share the, um, the, I don't know, blame. <laughs> No, I must share the credit um, for this name with with my colleague at our studio, Hadley Wickham. So, so um, I think, in my opinion, Hadley is very good at naming things. And so we we actually had like some lists. I you know I went through some sort of other iterations of names, and um, at at one point there were. So I think Hadley and I share a fondness for fancy candles. And what um, Hadley had sent me like a list of things from the world of perfumery. And when, the reason that I really chose this one and landed on this one is that um, it is this stabilizing ingredient. And so um, just as vetiver, the perfumery ingredient, stabilizes the other more volatile fragrances in a perfume, vetiver, the software, um, provides that like that stabilizing for your model for your deployed model that like you can have confidence and um, have the tranquility like the oil of tranquility super that's a nice uh yeah that's a nice way to to put it thank you julia and thank you everyone that was here and uh, on for all the questions um sorry for the ones that uh, we didn't have the time to to look at but uh, I think we are uh, at the time and just uh, thank you everyone. And just remember the, the member uh, sessions that I remember uh, that I uh, presented at the uh, start of the session that will be uh, next uh, from this keynote and tomorrow at 7 a.m. CD time. And hope everyone's uh, join, join the conference and we'll see each other tomorrow again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.